namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa honor to him the blessed one the worthy one the fully enlightened one hello everyone welcome to our first day guest lecture series today we have the guest lecture number 36 so far we have invited uh, quite a number of buddhist scholars and practitioners from around the world to share their wisdom with our dharma usa community and every thursday 6 pm pacific time we conduct this live guest lecture on the basis of buddhism and so different topics can be related to buddhism and we are honored to have today dr surachai anchan uh, with us he will discuss about enlightenment on wheel the passage of buddha's teaching dr surachai um He is a retired scholar and a researcher with a profound passion for Buddha's teaching. With 36 years of experience as a faculty member in pharmacology at Sri Lanka University, he was recognized as a role model teacher in 2003. Throughout his career, Dr. Anshan traveled to Japan, mainly the University of Tokyo. for phd studies and groundbreaking research in neuropharmacology after retiring from chulalanko university he continued his academic journey at siam university's faculty of medicine however health issues led him to retire once more in 2016 prompting him to embrace a peaceful life at home In July 2017, seeking spiritual enlightenment, Dr. Anshan embarked on a transformative journey. He took bhikkhu ordination at the Buddhist Thai Buddhist Thai temple in Vaishali, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, India. During his time as a bhikkhu, he dedicated himself to teaching Dhamma. to indian samanera and samaneri though he eventually returned from malkur dr anchan's quest for knowledge and understanding of theravada buddhism remained unwavering today he actively actively delves into the depths of buddha's teaching continuously seeking and propagating what he believes to be the authentic dharma to fellow buddhist worldwide join us on a captivating journey as we explore the profound wisdom and teachings of buddha buddha through the eyes of dr surachai anchan a scholar term spiritual right let me uh warmly welcome dr surachai hello dr <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your introduction. Very nice. Yeah. So, how are you doing today? Oh, fine. I'm. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> okay. It's my time uh, to join this uh, Dharma session. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> Everything will be fine. All right. <laughs> so, you are based in um, Bangkok. Yes, yes, sir. I'm living in Bangkok. Okay. What do you do these days? Ah, uh, nowadays I, uh, I would say I'm a stay with slow life mm. in my home. Okay. So, okay. and uh, maybe searching for new informations okay. and writing. Okay. uh some documents of story okay 
So you continue to research on Buddhist science? Yes, yes, yes. What is, uh, is your thesis title? Pardon? Uh, you said you did your PhD in Tokyo University? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what is the, the title of your thesis? It's very, very, very peculiar. The thesis, the thesis title is uh, Toxicity of Piperin, mm. an alkaloid from Thai herbal plant, mm. pepper. Yeah. And it has neurotoxicity to, to neuron. Mm. But yeah, in I, high concentrations. Oh, nice. So I, I was very curious, like you were also into pharmacology and yeah. you were teaching in the Chula Langhorn, uh, one of the prestigious universities in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So we would uh, also like to listen to you and um, to you are sharing of the Dhamma today on uh, Buddhist studies, uh, especially the Buddha's teaching. And uh, again, thank you, join, thank you for joining us uh, today with our Dhamma USA community. We have people um, from different countries, uh, especially from, uh, the West and also from the East. So I am sure that uh, your uh, teaching today can benefit uh, many people from around the world. And uh, over to you, Dr. Sulisai. Okay, let me start. First of all, I would like to say good morning from Thailand to all <laughs> Participant. Yeah, it is noon in time. <laughs> yeah. Today, I have a great pleasure to share with you some of my knowledge or experience on the topic of the passage of Buddha teachings. Because I'm a newcomer to these forums, and I didn't know. I sorry, I don't know that. Uh, how many topics that uh, all of you have listened? So, for the safe side, I decided to share with you how were Buddha teaching preserved and propagated from Buddha era to nowadays. It's a simple uh, topics. The topic will describe as following the Buddha as a great teacher. The passage of Buddha teachings, rehearsal of Buddha teaching, and five Buddhist councils, in particular in Theravada Buddhism. Finally, I would like to briefly overview on the Pitaka or Pali Canon recorded teaching of Buddha. Let's start with the Buddha as a great teacher. You know that Buddhism, while it spread to become the most popular and prominent teaching in ancient India during Buddha times, today Buddhism remains as one of the most successful religions and is still spreading and gaining popularity. The question is, how did Buddha become so successful in spreading his teaching? The answers are, firstly, Buddha explained very central and fundamental issue to human beings, the problem of sufferings or tukka. He found the answer to achieving perfect delight and happiness by ending tukka. Secondly, Buddha great ability as a teacher. He had incomparable ability to train and tame human beings and unlimited competency to teach both humans 
and terrestrial beings. Buddha used various methods to teach different people so that uh, the, they can easily understand deep doctrine and difficult tamma. Buddha used story, poem, folk tales, images, metaphor, and ask questions, including engagement in dialogue, discussion, and even in debates. In addition, Buddha used a gradual approach when teaching people. He adjusts it to, uh, to comply with ability, capacity, and background of listener by starting first with general topics, what we call Anupupikata. When the listener was ready, Buddha then taught unique lessons and Tama, for example, for noble truth and noble eightfold path. More importantly, Buddha was available at any time to approach and never tired of teaching. He thought openly and freely without keeping any secret, thereby encouraging his disciples to learn and to practice Dhamma. So, in summary, Buddha grasped compassion, unique ability, excellent teaching method, skill as a communicator, ability to understand the listener, and dedication as a teacher. All together made Buddha such a great teacher. Then we come to the passage of Buddha teachings. It is absolute necessity to preserve teaching of Buddha in order to maintain Buddhism for the next generations. Originally, Buddha teaching passed on orally by verbal communication between persons. Because in Buddha, uh, era, people were used to remember things by heart or by memorization because writing was not a common practice at that time. The meetings of Buddhists, including uh, monastic and lay peoples, at special places during rainy seasons, allow passing on recent teachings and reminder of others. And you know that rainy season lasts for many weeks, which uh, permit plenty of time for discussion and learnings. By the way, great effort had been made to preserve Buddha teaching even when Buddha was still alive. The initial rehearsal of Buddha teachings was done in Pawa, a capital of Mala district, in Mango Grove of Junta Goldsmith. It comprised 500 Piku who were directed by Sali Putera for half a day under support of Mala King of Pawa. And the motivation for this rehearsal is as follows. Nearly the end of Buddha's lifetime, Nikanta Natabut, the father of Jainism, passed away, and disciples had failed to collect his teachings. Then they were greatly divided and engaged in intense argument as to what exactly the teacher had preached. So, Junta Thela, did this different person with uh, Junta the Cosmic, brought this news to Buddha. 
who recommend that all the Sangha should take part in rehearsing Tama in order to ensure sustainable existence of teachings for benefits of Sangha community. At that time, Sariputera addressed this matter to the Sangha by stating that the problem with Jainism arose because the father teachings had not been collected and compiled. Therefore, disciple of Buddha to conduct a rehearsal to collect and compile his teaching so that uniform standard could be established. Sari Buttera then demonstrate how a rehearsal to be conduct in front of a Buddha and the assembly of Sangha. He collect Buddha teachings by memorization and explain them, arranging them in groups of itemized dhamma according to number or item involved, ranging from groups of one to group of ten. Once the rehearsal by 500 Piku was over, Buddha expressed approval and endorsed teachings collected and explained by Zali Buttera. This is the initial rehearsals before Buddha Parinipan. This procedure is then called Sankiti or Sankayana and translated into English as rehearsal or mutual recitation. As well, it is often referred to as Buddhist council according to Western concept. The primary purpose of the rehearsal is to preserve original Buddha te uh, teaching sorry, as accurately as possible. The responsibility or duty of participant is to collect, check, rehearse, and reveal Buddha teachings. Any opinions or teachings that deviate or different from original Buddha teaching are to be corrected accordingly. Finally, the Sangha Chan corrected Buddha teaching in harmony, therefore register them to memory and then pass them to others and hand out to future generations. In fact, there are inconsistent number of Buddhist councils worldwide. However, in strict Theravada Buddhism, for example, in Sri Lanka, there are only five acceptable Buddhist councils after Buddha times. And they are the first Buddhist council took place around 543 years BCE before Christian era in India. The, the purpose of this council is to recite and reconfirm Tama and Vinaya to protect and preserve Buddha teachings. The second Buddhist council took place around 442 years BCE in India. In this case, ten dispute point of Vinaya led to a split, a split between liberal Mahasankika and orthodox Tawariwada and lead to what we call great schism or great breakup or great separation in Buddhism. The third Buddhist council took place around 250 years 
BCE in India. The results of the council are purification of the Sangha by King Asok and sending of missionary Piku to nine different regions, including Sri Lanka. The fourth Buddhist council took place around 244 years before Christian era in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the fourth one, uh, you cannot see my slide, is took place around, oh, sorry, 50 years BCE in Sri Lanka. And this led to the uh, establishment of written Tipitaka or Pali Canon. So let me explain in detail about each Buddhist councils, starting from the first Buddhist councils. Although Sari Buttera set an example of how rehearsal should conduct, he did not live long enough to continue with his work as he passed away before Buddha did. However, task of rehearsing Buddha teaching was carried on by another Buddha disciple, namely Mahakasapa Thera, who was the most senior Thera when Buddha attained Parinthapan. By the way, Mahakasapa Thera learned of Buddha passing away seven days later, when he was traveling accompanied by a large group of his pupils. On hearing this news, many of, this, of his pupils, who were still worthy beings, or concerned with material value, start to weep and crying over Buddha passing away. However, a Piku named Supata, who had been ordained in his old age, said to them, why bother to weep at all? It is night that Buddha has attained his Parinipan. When he was alive, he was always being very strict with us, forbidding us to do this, telling us to do that. We had difficulty being on our behaviors. Now that he had passed away, we may do just what, just as we like. We will do whatever we like, and we not do whatever we don't like. On hearing this, Mahakasapa Thera thought that even shortly after Buddha Parinipan, there were people who attempt to deviate from doctrine and discipline. Therefore, it was advisable to rehearse Buddha teaching. By the way, Mahakasapa Thera had to travel to Kusignara and preside over the cremation of Buddha under auspices of Malakin. When the cremation was over, Mahakasapa Thera continued his plan by inviting junior Arahans for the rehearsal. All of these Arahans had all met Buddha in person, listening to his teachings, and had regularly held discussion and cross-checking one another, thereby knowing what constitutes genuine Buddha teachings. The rehearsal took three months to prepare before taking place at Sattapanakuha cave on Mount Vepara 
outside Rajakrut, under auspices of King Achasatru. This process took seven months to complete. In this council, Mahakasapa Thera presided over the assembly of 500 senior Arahans and also act as questioner about teaching, which divide into two major domains, doctrines or Tama and discipline or Vinaya. Tama is teachings on the truth of all things, along with way of practice advised by Buddha. And Vinaya is collection of rules laid down by Buddha that regulate the conduct or behavior of Bhikkhu and Pikuni. It is notable that Apitama and ancient commentaries, what we call Atakata, were also included in Dhamma as well. In the councils, two famous senior Pikku were selected for their accurate retention of birth of Buddha and expertise in each domain of teaching. And they are Anantera. I, I will use Thai <laughs> pronunciation. Buddha personal attendant who had always listened to Buddha teaching. He was assigned to recite the Tamma. And Ubali Thera, senior Pikku, Personally praised by Buddha as excellent in Vinaya, he was chosen as leader in qualifying issue related to the Vinaya. In the process, to Thera recite Buddha teaching to the assembly, then Mahakaspa Thera systematically questioned on teaching in sequence and in classified group. After a consensus was reached on a given content, the Sangha would chant it all together so that approved content would be sorry, certain as model for memorization and transmission by oral tradition later on. It is notable that Buddha had told Anantera before he, his uh, Paritipan that some of minor Vinaya rules could be changed. But Anantera didn't ask which ones. It was then decided not that no change were to be made and Vinaya rules were preserved as originally laid down by Buddha. And this is the drawing of the first Buddhist council in action. Then come the second Buddhist council, which is uh, maybe the biggest and complicated uh, councils in Buddhism. The second Buddhist council was held 100 years after Buddha Parinipan in order to settle Vinaya rules. Vaishali was chosen, and it was the place where 10 Vinaya rules were relaxed by a large group of wealthy Pachyan Pikus. In this case, Pachi was an idiot was an independent and powerful confederation ruled by a group of rulers. It comprised of eight tribes centered around Waichali. The leading tribe was Lichui. So, Pachyan Piku are powerful and rich. 
The council was held at Warikaram, presided over by Revata Tera, supported by King Karaso. And 700 Arahan at 10 did last for eight months. In fact, King Karaso was very fond of Vachyan Piku. However, he was then convinced to support the council. Causes of these councils are Yaksa Tera discovered that Wachian Bhikkhu had collected gold and silver from lay disciples. He strongly objected to this practice. Later, Wachian Bhikkhu offered a fortune of Yaksa Tera, but he refused to accept it. Yasa Tera blamed the disciple for giving gold and silver to Wachian Piku. Then Wachian Piku imposed the act of con reconciliation, sorry, or asking pardon from lay man or lay person to Yasa Tera as they want to convince that giving gold and silver was proper. This is the first enforcement. Yaksa Tera went into town and told their people, their disciples, I acknowledge that religious laymen have good intention, but this behavior is Atama and Avinaya. He cited these causes by Buddha, which described that Bhikkhu were forbidden to go and silver. Once again, Wachiyan Piku decided to impose the act of suspension or interruption of duty on Gaza Tera to silence his objection and to show that it's what proper to accept gold and silver from the disciple. However, all these two enforcement were not successful. In addition, Yasa Tera also found that Wachian Piku was conduct things uh, other night non-permissible acts in addition to accepting gold and silver, the so-called Ten Points Acts, which Yasa Tera considered as uh, a winner yet. However, at that time, Wachian Piku were abundant and powerful and had a lack of central control. Therefore, a large number of respected Piku is needed to settle down that 10 points act were Avinaya. In this connection, Yasa Tera had to gather sufficient Piku who agree with him. So he decided to seek help from Piku of the West who were more conservative in their practice. He visited Samputa Tera who agree with him. Then he decided to consult Revata Tera who was excellent in Tama and Vinaya. Revata Tera also agreed that there are two questions which Jan Piku about 10 point act. Therefore, Revata Tera decided to arrange second council that inspired by misbehavior of wealthy Wachian Piku who tried to escape the investigation by firstly attempting to buy Revata Tera with gift of requisite. Secondly, ask Uttara Tera, who was Revata Tera's personal attendant, to influence him 
to accept 10 point X that proposed by Bachian Piku. Thirdly, offering leadership to Uttara Thera. If he dismissed Revata Thera's request to prohibit Avinaya behavior of Wachijan Piku. So you can see that Wachijan Piku are very are tricky. Revata Thera then approached Sapak Kamin Thera, who well respect Piku of 120 years old, whose ordination preceptor of Upacha was Anan Anontera. Anont yeah. Finally, to oppose a strong Vaishali Buddhist communities, impressive representatives of Buddhist community were made with 700 arahants. The procedure as, uh, is as follows. There were too many debates in this council. Therefore, the matter would be judged by a jury. A group of people comprising of four people from the east and four people from the west. Revata Thera would question Sapakhamin Thera in front of the Sangha on each of 10 points act. Sapakhamin Thera would refer to a press where the act was first committed and punishment which would be conferred for the offense. The results are the council was able to convince by reference to Vinaya rules that 10 points act performed by Wachiyan Piku were contrary to discipline. And finally, the Sangha rehearsed all Vinaya rules and they were approved. The consequences of the council are complicated. Piku who believed in original Buddha teachings were considered Stavari Wada, endorsing Theravada Buddhist point of view or doctrine of the elders. However, Wachiyan Piku were not satisfied with second council. So they separate into another group, so-called Maha Sankhika, or Grace Assembly, and held their own council. They were able to invite 10,000 people to gather at, Bali, at Patali Bud. It is assumed that Maha Sankhika is the originator or the initiators of Mahayana Buddhism. But it is still waiting for conclusive evidence. So there become a great breakup of the Sangha 100 years after Buddha Parinipan. And this become known as great schism or great breakup or great separation. After Second Buddhist Council, there were 18 Buddhist schools exist up to King Asok period. And these are drawings of the Second Buddhist Council in action. Then come the third Buddhist clauses, which took place about 236 years after Buddha passing away. It's what held at Asoka Ram in Patalibut and preside over, over by 
โอกาลีบุตรคริสตะเทระ it was under royal patronage of king a s o k and this occurred at the seven years sorry the seventeen years of king a s o k uh, enthronement when he was seventy two years old one year younger than me <laughs> In fact, King Asok was originally a particular ambitious and cruel man, a cruel man, who attained the throne by killing all of his father's sons, except his own real brother. Then he went on to conquer neighboring state, causing uncountable death and destruction. However, King Asok eventually. Convert to Buddhism. He then ruled according to Buddhist principle of non-violence and compassion, and his empire flourished greatly. He spread Buddhism throughout India, through rock edicts and pillars, which had important teaching inscribed on them. King Asok used his vast wealth to build countless stupa, temples, and vihara throughout India, and provide generous support to to the sangha. However, this foraging led to many unwholesome and greedy people joining the sangha, who hold wrong view and preach deviating dhamma. King Asok then asked respected senior Piku, Mokali Bud, ah, sorry, Mokali Bud, Tisa Tela, in Thai pronunciation, to help remedy this regretful situations. Tela select one thousand Piku to recite and confirm Thamma and Vinaya, and these took eight month, sorry, nine month. To complete, the king also questioned Piku from many monastery, and those who had wrong views were exposed and immediately expelled from the sangha. Therefore, the sangha was eradicated of guilty belief, corrupt and fake Piku. In addition, the fifth book of a b i t a m m a p i t a k a called Katawatu, a point of controversy, was initially compiled to examine and disprove deviating t e l a w a d doctrine and Buddha teaching. However, the most significant achievement of this council. Was setting up missionary p i k u to nine different region around India, and the most important and successful mission was to Sri Lanka. And this was led by King Asok San Mahinta Thera, who converted Sri Lankan King Thewa Nampiya Thissa and eventually all his group to Buddhism, as well. The p i t a k a which was learned by heart, was also brought over to Sri Lanka as well. And this is the drawing of the third Buddhist council in action. You can see this is King Asok and his uh, peoples. Then come the fourth Buddhist council, which is uh, a small council upon missionary Piku arrival in Sri Lanka. After listening to Mahinta Thera teaching, King t e w a n a m p i y a t i s a became a lay disciple and established 
a Buddhist monastery called Mahavihan in Anuradhapura. The Fourth Buddhist Council was held around 244 years BCE in Mahavihan to Param. It was presided over by Mahinta Thera under the patronage of King Thera Nampiyatissa. The primary purpose is to preserve original Buddha teachings as accurately as possible in order to maintain Buddhism in Sri Lanka. Later on, around 240 years BCE, a branch of Bodhi tree, a Bodhi tree from India was exported to Sri Lanka by Sankhamita Theri, King Asok's daughters. An ordination lineage was start for Pikuni. Here come the fifth Buddhist council. During the last century BCE, Sri Lanka suffered a civil war and foreign invasion, and thereby forcing Buddhism to a severe decline. As you have known that Buddha teaching was passed down all the way. So this was no longer possible in the chaotic state. Therefore, it was unlikely for a majority of Sangha to retain entire Pitaka, Atipitaka in their memories. However, at that period of time, the art of writing has developed substantially. It would be beneficial and necessary to have entire Buddha teaching written down. Accordingly, Therawad has a fifth Buddhist council about 50 years BCE in a cave called Alu Vihan, situated near what is now Matale, under the patronage of King Watakamani Apaya. These councils were held particularly to preserve genuine Buddha, Buddha teaching. Permanently, by transcribing entire Tipitaka into writings. In this council, Maharakita Thera and 500 Piku recite words of Buddha and then wrote them down on palm or ola leaves. After these councils, palm leaf Tipitaka appears and was taken to other countries such as Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. Finally, let me explain briefly about Tipitaka or Pali Canon, the record teaching of Buddha. Tipitaka means three baskets, which literally designed for three major divisions of Buddha teaching. This is generally known to Westerners as Pali Canon, a Buddhist Canon. Why? Because it contains fundamental principle of Theravada Buddhism. And text of this canon is recorded in in Bali or Makati language. Tipitaka is not a single volume scripture, but an enormous set of scriptures containing as many as 84,000 textual units or Dhammakanta. Tipitaka divided into three major scriptures of Buddhist teachings. 
The first one is Vinaya Pitaka, the collection of monastic rule laid down by Buddha for Bhikkhu and Bhikkhuni containing 21,000 units. The second is Sutta or Sutanta Pitaka, the collection of this course specific teaching that was adapted, explained by Buddha to such individuals, place, and event or situation in question. Together with supplemental materials containing 21,000 units. The third one is Abhidhamma Pitaka, collection of teaching with ultimate explanation that are purely substantive or academic without reference to any individuals or events containing 42,000 units. This scripture of the Pitaka is classified into sections and further classified into a complex subsection. At the end of my talks, I would like to bring about the Buddha final order, that is unknown. The doctrine and discipline I have set forth and laid down for you all shall be your teacher after I have passed away. And I would like to give you the take home message as follows. For the past 2,611 years, Buddha teaching have shown the path towards enlightened human life. In the modern world, Buddha teaching may be the only hope of futures. You should remember that those who see the Tama see the Buddha. So, thank you for your attention. Satu, 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 Anumo Tami. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddhartai, for that wonderful presentation. Um, yes, so um, we do have quite a few questions from our community. We have Vita of Dhamma uh, asking several questions. Um, yeah. Um, is the Bojanga Sutta part three discussing about Mahatma Sutta's great contribution? As mentioned in the section of the slides, rehearsal of the best teachings. Um, so, whenever Mahatma uh, um, I think, think out of the three Bojanga Sutras, uh, was not really part of them. Uh, um, not sure if he was also a part of the, uh, the first Buddhist. Probably yes. <laughs> oh, this is a question or a comment. I I I am I'm, I'm not sure that. Yeah. It is. Uh, um, told you in fact 
there are different number of, of Buddhist clusters worldwide. In other country or uh, Nikaya, they may have more than five Buddhist council, including one in Myanmar and, and once in, in India. So I would like to focus on this council which uh, was approved by the Sri Lankan uh, Buddhist which is a Thelawad. But if you want to know more about the whole Buddhist council, you can search the internet or <laughs> any kind of information source to learn about more Buddhist councils. I, I'm not sure that uh, how, what is the total number of, of Buddhist Council? Yeah, I think um, the first Buddhist Council is called Pancha Satika Pancha Satika because there were 500 uh, Arahant monks in all after three, uh, three months of the Buddha's Paramidvana. And then we had um, the second uh, Buddhist Council called Satya Satika. There were 700 monks as uh, Dr. Which I mentioned um, in my presentation, um, and there was um, an issue with the Wadi, uh, 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 issue of ten ten uh, and then uh, the third Buddhist council during the King Ashoka period, uh, they are the most uh, important. Probably, maybe after that only the. Even the Abhidharma Kittito normally uh, complete um, in today's context. And then we have uh, the fourth Buddhist council as uh, uh, Dr. Anshan mentioned, uh, that happened in Sri Lanka. Um, so the first century, I think it is first century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that time um, the the whole uh, Tipitaka was uh, receiving only uh, all the leaves and in Marale uh, Aloka mm -hmm. and um, um, I think simultaneously there was another uh, another uh, council in Sashmi. Right? Oh yeah yeah yeah. 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 That the, that considered yeah. the four, the four councils in yes. Kashmir. So some, some scholars have actually even um, they call that is the the fourth council and uh, and um, so King Kanishka was the one who patronized that there were mostly the Mahayana um, schools, uh, that's that right involved yes mm. and uh, so fifth um, council and then um, I think after that it is the chapter Sangayana right in Myanmar. Mm. Mandalay, there uh -huh. were 3,500 monks involved um, uh -huh. in 1956. So, in commemoration of 2,500 years of Buddhism, the six chapters of the uh, was um, summoned, and many, many monks uh, participated. Maybe some of the, the the great monks who participated in that event probably still might be living some in some country. I remember some monks from Sri Lanka also participated, but now uh, they are no more. Um, yeah, so that's very really, uh, interesting. So these uh, councils have been very helpful to uh, this community. Uh, do you have any any other words to add? Oh, pardon? Uh, do you have anything else to add? Oh, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, studied uh, 
to an extent about uh, the uh, Buddhist councils. Mm -hmm. I noticed that all people that um, join the councils, they were all arahants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, Thailand, we have um, a few Buddhist councils in, in, in Thailand. But I don't think they have orang in the councils. So I think uh, they may be not count at the Buddhist councils in terms of, of, of uh, members that are not orang. Yeah, I, I don't think like, they have uh, <laughs> Yeah, definitely like uh, the later councils were not attended by probably not orang. Mm. They were more scholarly monks. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe uh, it, according to our Buddhist history, uh, the first Buddhist council should definitely be. Um, it, it is apparent that the Arahanta monks, uh, there were enough uh, Arahanta monks to attend. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is why Venerable Ananda also had to meditate. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> He was able to attain Arahanta who that the very last thing to say. So, <laughs> yeah, that happened. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I think um, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit more uh, Okay, let me see if we have a question. Okay, I think maybe you can elaborate. I don't understand the reason behind why the Vajjian bhikkhus impose various different courses of the second Buddhist council. Would you like to elaborate on this? Ah, that's a uh, very good question. I think Vajjian bhikkhu uh, were wealthy. And powerful, so they use everything to uh, prohibit Yasa Terra uh, from uh, reject the reject or reject uh, the Ten Point Act. And the reason why watching people impose for it act to Yasa Thela. I think it's like uh, a, a kind of, of uh, political <laughs> affair. You have to, to uh, dis discredit the opponent by, in this case, using enforcement in, the, in order to uh, suppress Yasatila and regain Pachian Piku popularity among uh, lay disciples. This is just what I have seen in today in Thailand. <laughs> Sorry to say that. I think you it is always the same. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the vast majority of them are not really true practitioners. Probably, um, we we have it in uh, everywhere. Like um, during the Buddha's time, also there were like monks like um, Subhadra, you know, and uh, they were they were not happy. Like they were not happy to follow the women rules, and they were just wanting to enjoy the life, like uh, free food and uh, a <laughs> lot of uh, facilities, a lot of uh, privileges for them to come about. And uh, so after the Buddha's period, uh, uh, passing away actually, um, this number of monks have grown really, really fast. And you can see like 
10,000 um, monks who were there, um, like Bahari Tavajis, <laughs> right? And there were only 700 um, for the second uh, Buddhist council. Probably uh, still, most number of monks were not really alone in the window. And um, so it, it went on growing. I think it has grown um, all the more faster in number. Like uh, even today, in uh, many different uh, uh, traditional Buddhist countries, you can see a um, mm. lot of um, issues with the dinner. Uh, so that happens. There is in Thai and those Lunka and Bhishma. But uh, those monks are also didn't have, um, you know, any story to. But in Thailand, you have Sangha Raja, right? Yeah. So one Sangha Raja, I, I think that uh, helps uh, a lot for the, uh, for the Sangha community in Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Sulita, would you like to explain a little bit about uh, the, the Sangha uh, system in uh, Thailand? Maybe it will help us understand. Uh, because I I think uh, in my estimate there are uh, around 400,000 Thai Buddhist monks. I know they include uh, the temporary ordination um, because unlike in Sri Lanka, Thailand uh, also has uh, temporary uh, ordination uh, like yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. You also became a monk for a while. So, uh, but there are quite a lot of monks in Thailand. But they are they are all under um uh, uh all of uh, people in Thailand are under control of what we call uh Sangha Sapa or the Sangha Councils of Thailand. Mm -hmm. And the Sangha is the head or the chairman of that councils of that uh, uh, councils and below the Sankara, Sankara, uh, Sankara we have many districts in Thailand the province in Thailand and they each province they have their own people head to control people in that province or districts. Mm. So, the division of uh, Piku society in Thailand, it's like a, uh, um, it's government service or government servant. We have the chairman, sub chairman, and, and lower, that's the kind of secretary or, or uh, many, many uh, individuals. Mm. The reason I I I think we have known that I was ordinated ordained for one year in India. Mm -hmm. The reason why I I, <laughs> I was I I stopped my my manhood because I think. I can do much more for Buddhism as a lay person, much more than a bhikkhu, because we have uh, many Vinaya rules that control us, 227 rules control us. So I cannot do all things that I want to do as a bhikkhu. <laughs> I cannot use telephone, I cannot use internet, I cannot uh, see video. So I decided to leave the manhood and spend my life as the lay person, mm -hmm. studying Dhamma and do many things to help improve Buddhism in Thailand and in other countries. <laughs> I think you you 
may disagree with my opinion, but that's the different yeah, yeah. individuals. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, like, uh, if you're practicing like Pariyati and Patipati, uh, practicing the Dharma, right? Uh, Pariyatu is like more scholarly practice, like you learn the Dharma, you teach the Dharma, uh, that also is very helpful for the propagation of the Dharma. And uh, Patipati is the practice that we all can do. Like uh, today, even as uh, Buddhist monks, for example, in the West, uh, when you become more learned monks, then it is helpful for the uh, for us to communicate with the community here, like uh, people will feel like, uh, you know, that's like a license, <laughs> uh, like you have studied in the university, you know the system here, uh, the history, the psychology, you know, uh, we know about them, then it, it becomes easier uh, for the monks to teach uh, the Dhamma, um, and I think even in uh, back, uh, uh, in the tradition of this country, uh, it's also important that the monks are more knowledgeable, especially about the Dhamma. <laughs> they have to be educated. Um, there are systems, wonderful systems, just like you said, uh, in uh, Myanmar, oh, sorry, in Thailand, you have that system, uh, like Chula Lumpur and other universities. Are there. And then uh, also in Myanmar, there is a wonderful system of learning the Dhamma, like even uh, learning the entire Dhamma, entire Tipitaka in um, memory. Um, there are wonderful monks like Tipitaka Dharma, and also they have a beautiful system to um, traditionally educate them. So that's important. And same here in Sri Lanka, we have um, like different Mikayas, like Siam Mikaya. Uh, there are few um, subsections under Siam Nikaya, and uh, all those uh, uh, monks, I think the vast majority of the Sri Lankan monks belong to the Siam Nikaya. And then there are subsections, they are all uh, under the control of uh, uh, most venerable Mahanai Kapheros and the Anuman Kapheros, and then as you mentioned, like uh, regional. Uh, Sangha, Naya uh, they actually uh, have the authority for the region of the monks. And um, traditionally, they are um, supposed to be uh, in their certain matters. Like during the Vasana period, they can also be. And for the uh, monthly Utosata, they can be. So they are to be. And also, apart from that, we have Amaratura Nikaya. Um, uh, Siam Nikaya hail from uh, Thai. Yeah. yeah, so we do have Thai tradition. Uh, and then the Amaratura Nikaya uh, and the late uh, Raman Nikaya, they uh, have uh, some from uh, Myanmar. Uh, but actually, all these ones, they have Mahanai Katero, Sanamak Katero. Adhikarana Nayaka Peros, like the judicial uh, Nayaka Peros, also um, having their own um, different hierarchy and also regional uh, Nayaka Peros and the Nayaka Peros. Uh, the system is really wonderful. The monks, and then the monastic schools are there. So they help um, um, even in the uh, most of the national uh, universities in Sri Lanka, they have uh, Buddhist and Pali uh, department, so where the monks can uh, study. And many monks are also very well uh, educated. Um, and then they teach um, in different institutes. Apart from that, there are two different separate uh, universities exclusively uh, for uh, dedicated to Buddhist study. One in Anuradhapura, that is for uh, uh, Bhikkhu University of Sri Lanka, that is uh, exclusively reserved for Buddhist monks. Only Buddhist monks are studying. I was teaching there uh, quite a few years. Uh, there are nearly 400 monks studying uh, part of um, Anuradhapura. And then there's another one called 
Buddhist and Pali University also very important university for Buddhist monks. Many Buddhist monks also um, learning here. Yeah. So check out the the modern day uh, education system uh, is there established. Apart from that, we have um, some other uh, forest monks. We have urban monks. Uh, we have like um, far remote area those ones. Uh, so they have maybe uh, different, little bit different, but they follow more or less the same tradition. They meet each other with many um, traditional traditions. Um, so uh, they, are, they are all like Thailand, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Laos. We all have the same Theravada uh, tradition. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, I hope it was helpful to our audience. Um, okay. This one. How do we expect the Buddha's teaching to all over the world? Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 This is very difficult to handle. <laughs> I think uh, the way uh, Buddhists uh, spread the teaching Buddha, uh, Buddha teaching, is is um, a kind of of um, not like a. Uh, Chris, uh, I may say that because in Buddhism we do not force any people to believe in Buddhism. We can induce or persuade them to study Buddhism and then see by themselves what Buddhism is like. So, if you want to spread Buddha teaching all over the world, you should have many uh, persons, including monastic or uh, lay people, who are expert expert in Tama or uh, Buddha teaching, and go around the world to propagate Buddha teachings. In this case, Buddhism will get in the blood of, of people all over the world. In my case, I spend some time oh, go to India after I, I, I finish ordinations. When I was uh, young, uh, not young, <laughs> old uh, lay person, and contributes my lecture in Buddhism to many Indian uh, persons, and uh, my wife, who has been ordained as Pikuni for four years, she also uh, helped to propagate Dhamma throughout the world. Now she was, uh, she is uh, uh, stay in Uruguay, in South America, and try to spread Buddhism into Uruguay. But that may be so difficult to, to obtain the objective because uh, Uruguay peoples do not speak Thai. <laughs> it's very difficult to communicate with them, especially in terms of Dhamma. So, I think we need many more peoples who are experts in Buddhism. 
Yeah, I think it is a very important question. Like, uh, um, we need to learn the Dhamma and we need to learn different languages. <laughs> that can be helped. <laughs> right? uh, especially la languages like, um, um, like most popular languages, Spanish language, English, uh, and then Chinese. And all these languages are mixed spoken by us. A number of people. So, if you are interested in teaching Dhamma, uh, first of all, you need to learn the Dhamma, you need to access the Dhamma, and then you can actually help in different ways. Um, like propagating the Dhamma in your own community, in your own country, and you can do it as well. You can uh, also like teach, uh, like the way that the um, so the child from the universities and the Dhamma schools and the schools and um, also public forums like like this, you know, you can, we also uh, welcome uh, any uh, any scholars and practitioners if you are interested in teaching the Dhamma online, we are very happy to welcome you and so we can uh, spread the Dhamma. Um, I remember like we were also um, a part of the um, Thai, um, uh, Thai peace walks. Uh, there were some Thai monks uh, who were um, who were traveling. They were walking actually, and I also participated in several walks with them. Um, one time we um, we joined a walk from New York to Washington D.C. for eleven days. And another time, um, we um, joined a walk uh, in Florida. We walked uh, 163 miles. And then uh, in uh, um, in uh, Italy, also we, we walked um, like we did uh, as months. And we went for arms round. I think that way also we can spread the Um A lot of months are uh, involved in they are teaching, they are walking, uh, they are also teaching in different ways. Um, yeah, a lo lot of people can do that. That makes that the suicide. Maybe there are some restrictions as a monk uh, for you to um, maybe do more. And if you feel comfortable, you can uh, still do that at the latest. Like, and we greatly appreciate uh, you are and most importantly, I think today it is so important that we um, spread this uh, noble message of peace and harmony. Like the world is, we can see a lot of people are frustrated, they have depression, they have stress. Maybe the Buddhist monks and Buddhist uh, community uh, can help them in so many different ways, like Dana Siddhartha and um like loving kindness you know so, so we can help so in terms of this one here i think she has another question now. maybe you can also respond to this question how do we practice buddha speaking in daily life right? oh <laughs> Starting from uh, simple uh, Buddha teaching, for example, the Pancha Sila, the Atta Sila, uh, the five, five Pancha Sila, yeah, Pancha Sila and, and eight Sila, I can't remember it. Uh, yeah, and we also have to follow uh, what we call Kutsala Kamma Pata, the way to behave as the uh, good man. And I think in our daily life, we cannot practice this noble eightfold part, right? <laughs> Because these are designed for Ariya Pukala or, or uh, 
person who attain state of Ariya Tukala. But we can use double eightfold path as a model or as an example for us to to maybe uh, imitate some point of noble eightfold path. And that should help your life become better and better day by day. Don't expect Parindipana. <laughs> you, you can't do that. But expect a daily life which is happy, which is peaceful, which is uh, uh, devoid of Lopa, Tosa, and Moha. I think as the lay person, it is possible to share some Buddha teachings in our daily life. As simple as I said, the Pancha Sila and other kind of Sila. And I think I recommend all young people to behave like this in your daily life, then you will become a good person, a better uh, adult, and live happily until you are uh, older, like me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sumatai, for that. Uh, this uh, uh, we love this is having a comment again. I was not aware of the fifth council, but I do remember I went to go visit the Aluvihara in Martha Sri Lanka and saw the glass cabinet with the original scriptures of the However, I do recommend the example uh, of the slot, especially if they are not used to the, the teaching. Um, during the Buddha time, oh, I think, so she just mentioned like she has visited Aloka Vihara. That is where the, the fifth Buddhist temple took place. Right, I think the question here, during the Buddha time, he spoke Sanskrit. His teachings were orally taught in Pali. It brings it that the initially spoke Pali in his childhood. It makes sense. <laughs> but if uh, Siddhartha spoke Sanskrit when he was young, how did he learn Pali? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a good question. But I'm sorry, I'm not uh, qualified to answer this one. <laughs> I think uh, Buddha was. Uh, a very clever man. No matter he speak as in his childhood, he can speak Bali or Makati when he uh, got enlightenment and can teach other people to Bali language. And Buddha prohibit all Sankha to teach people in Sanskrit. I think uh, this is maybe uh, contradict to some uh, opinion from the modern scholar. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Buddha was more of a scholarly language. Mm -hmm. So Sanskrit was confined to some of the priestly class and uh, so the other people didn't really use the Sanskrit language. 
but Pali, even even when we compare Sanskrit and Pali, Pali is the most soft, soft spoken language, mm. and it was more of a popular kind of language. It could have been the case like Pali was largely understood by other people, then it's a, like common folk. So Buddha must have used that language. Like in India, even today, there are so many languages and subcultures that I already, I think, know. I also studied in India, so I know that too. But many languages are there in many parts of the country. So, but then they also know how to communicate uh, in uh, other people's languages. So probably in the Buddha's time, um, he, he probably must have learned Sanskrit. Um, but uh, he used uh, this language, um, Pali, Magadhi, during that uh, middle um, India, like mid section of the country. Uh, that probably must have been helpful to many people when he spoke in school. Uh, yeah, so learning language is not difficult. <laughs> uh, Welcome. I am yeah. really uh, happy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> because we started uh, today with the history. Probably we can go to enlightenment close to that uh, topic um, in another uh, session. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Sultai. Thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I heard there was some background uh, noise. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, Sorry, it, uh, it was not um, possible for you, some of you, to um, hear, hear us properly. And we really appreciate uh, everyone for joining. And also, uh, we wish you all a very happy, wonderful, and peaceful day with the blessings of the Noble Church. And looking forward to seeing you with another session on Thursday. And tune us um, with us. On Thursday at 6 p.m. Thank you. And thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sathu, 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.